discuss some of uh, other types of paradigms. As, and if you, for completeness sake only we are discussing this paradigm, with the assumption that you have the base, basic knowledge of paradigm. And uh, here uh, we like to we like to mention about uh, the type of problem uh, we handle under different types of uh, paradigms. So the second paradigm what we like to discuss today is greedy method. Okay. Now here let us assume that. Uh, there are n possible, there are n possible uh, entity and you want to find out the best solution uh, using this, uh, this n entity, okay. Now say you want it to be n entities and now you have to say, select one by one so that you get the best possible solution for your problem. So initially you have uh, say if I write the algorithm greedy, genetic algorithm for greedy and uh, a and n parameters, then you will be writing that your solution initially is phi which is null solution and then you have to select uh, one after another. So for i equals to 1 to n, 1 to n and then x equals to select uh, one parameter out of n and you check, you check whether by selecting x you that solution, this will lead to a feasible solution or not. If x leads to feasible solution, to a feasible solution of your problem, solution of the problem, then you update your solution by solution union x, otherwise you discard x, otherwise you discard else discard x. That means that this x will not lead to the feasible solution. <coughs> okay, this is a simple strategy we follow, we follow under the greedy strategy. Now one example is that I don't know whether you have seen the steps, magnetic steps, and these are uh, a large size and uh, we used to uh, store the data uh, or file into this magnetic steps and uh, suppose you have the files F1, F2, F3 and Fn files and the size of this file is S1, S2, S3, Fn. Now we like to store this file into the magnetic tape in such a way that it takes the minimum amount of time, okay. So suppose I have the three files, F1, F2, F3 and the size of the file is say 20, 10 and say 5 or 20, 10 and then 50. So if I start saving the first file of F1, then F2, then F3, then the total number of uh, record movements in that magnetic tape is that first time it will be saving to a file F1 of size 20 records and then it will rewind back. So second time if I store the F2, so first it will move up to this and then it will write again 10. So there you need 30 record movement, movements and third time. 
So it will go 30. And then 15. So you need 45 record movement. The total number of record movement becomes 20 plus 30 plus 45, which is 95. Now, if I think the other way, then no, I will store first F2, then F1, then F3, what happens? First time 10, second time it is 10, and then 20. So this becomes 30. And the third time, this 30 movement plus 15. So this gives you 45. Okay. That means 10 plus 30 plus 45. This gives you 85 record movements. Now what happens if I save the files in the form F2, F3, and then F1? What happens? First F2, which is the 10. Next time it is 10 plus 15, it is 25. And then next time it is 45. So it becomes 10 plus 25 plus 45, it becomes 70, 80. Okay? And this is the minimum number of record, records to be moved to store all these three files into the magnetic tape. So, what is the strategy you follow here? That you have n files, f1, f2, fn, and with the size S1, S2, Sn respectively. The x initial solution is 5 and for i equals to 1 to n and now you will be selecting x for uh, from the set of n you will be selecting the file which is the smallest in size. Okay? So S1 is the solution and is it leads to, yes it will lead to the solution. So you are sold, storing it and your solution. So sol becomes sol union x1, x1 is x, which is the smallest file size. And then next time, again you take or uh, get the next smallest one and you add it and so on. Okay. So this is the one strategy, uh, 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 this is the greedy method to solve the problem of storing the files into the magnetic. Now the next problem is well known to you, which is knapsack problem. Okay, do you know what is knapsack problem, right? Uh, is it clear? If not, let me tell you what is knapsack problem. Let us assume that you have that n entities x1, x2, x3, xn. And to select Xi, you want the profit Pi, okay? So you have the profit P1, P2, P3, Pn. To select Pi, you want the profit Pi. To select Xi, you want the profit Pi. And each entity has certain weights. Say W1 is the weight that has two X1, weight X3, and wait here. Now there is exist a bin of capacity, a bin capacity F. Now problem is to select, to select uh, some of excess and put them into this bin whose capacity is N such that you earn the maximum profit. Okay, so what is the problem? Problem is to select some of the excess and put them into the capacity bin of capacity M in such a way that you earn the maximum profit. Right? So basic problem is that if I sell W3 weight or WI weights of item of XI, then I earn the profit PI and I want to maximize my profit but with the condition is that, that my bin can take up to the load of M unit of weight. 
Now, one thing should be clear to you that my bean, if it is not full, then I should take some more items from here to get uh, uh, into the, to put into the bin so that I earn little more profits, okay? So I can write that maximize, this problem I can write, maximize pi xi, i is equals to 1 to n, such that, or subject to the condition, subject to the condition, summation over wy xi i is 1 to n is less than equals to m, and xi is lying between 0 and 1, and weights are positive, right? So what happens? The problem is that I have x1, x2, xn are the entities, pi is, uh, wi is the weight attached to xi, and pi is the profit attached to the item xi, and you have a beam of capacity m. You want to select some of the xi such that your bean is full and also you want the maximum profit. So the problem can be redefined, maximize summation pi xi, xi i equals to zero, i equals to one to n, subject to the condition that summation over wi xi less than equals to n, and xi is zero and one. What does it mean xi is lying by zero and one? That it is zero if you don't select. If it is one, you select the whole item. Whole item means that you select wi weights total, right? Or you can select, you can select small amount of, small amount of wi of the xi equal xi uh, ith component or ith item. Now, how to solve this problem? So let us consider one small example. Suppose I have three items, item one, item two, and item three. And the item weight is, the one is having the weight 5, this weight is having 10, and this have weight is having, say, 4. And uh, I earn the profit is, say, 7, 10. Here it can be 15, and it can be uh, 8, 7, 6. It can be, uh, say, seven. Okay. So this is your weight, and this is your profit. So that means that if I sell five k unit of item one, I earn the profit ten, and if I sell ten unit of item two, I earn the profit fifteen. 4 unit of item 3, I earn the profit of 7. Now I want to, and I have a capacity, I have a capacity of say 8. Now, how to select this 8 unit of material? Right, one possible thing that I select item 1 completely and 3, three unit from item 2. That means 5, 3 and 0. Another one can be 2, 6 and not 6, say 2, 4, 2, maybe one possibility. There are, no, another possibility could be 3, 3, 2, and so on. If it is the case, then how much I earn the profit, or what is the profit amount? So I earn 5, so I earn 10, then I 3, that means 15 divided by 10 into 3. Okay, so this is the FCO, so 14.5. Now, in this case, 
10 divided by 5 into 2 plus 15 divided by 10 into 4 plus 7 divided by 4 into 5. So this is 1. This is 4 plus 1.56 plus 3.5. So it is 13.5. Here, 10 by 5 into 3 plus 15 by 10 into 3 plus 7 by 4 into 3. You get 6 plus 4.5 plus 3.5, 8, 14, and so on. So you observe that you are, this gives the better profit among them. But how to, how to select, or what should be the best possible way to select uh, or wait so that, so that uh, your bill is full and I earn the maximum profit? So one possibility is that because here you observe that we have considered that weight as a factor. Weight is related with by profit. So I should obtain what is the power unit profit. Now let us find out the power unit profit that is P by W. So it is 2, it is 1.5 and this is 1.75. This is 1.75. Okay, so if I that means that I, I must I must they, I must uh, I, uh, put as much as I can from the item one into my bin. Okay, uh, because I am getting power unit profit is maximum on item one. And if it is the case, if it is the case, so I will take five unit. 5 unit of item 1, then next item is coming this one because this gives the power unit profit is maximum. So what I should do, I should take 3 unit directly from here, 3 units directly from here so that and 0 unit from here so that you get the maximum profit. So if it is, it is your selection is like that, then your earned profit 10 plus 0 plus So you want a profit 15, 25, which is the maximum profit you can earn. So in terms of in terms of general, in terms if I consider the generalized problem that you have uh, P1, P2, Pn is profit with reference to uh, item I, you have the weight Wy, then the selection procedure is that you first obtain the power unit profit for each item. And after obtaining the power unit property, then you select first the unit uh, having the maximum profit and try to put the, as much as you can into the B. Now, after putting that maximum profit here, you get the next highest profit one and try to put as much as you can into the B and so on. Finally, you will get some fraction, some fraction will be there of the IS one to put here. And if I add this, you will be getting the maximum profit. So that is the giddy strategy for finding the knapsack problem, finding uh, for, for solving the knapsack problem. Now let us consider the another interesting problem that is optimization patterns. Now what is the problem here? Problem is that suppose I have files F1, F2, F3, Fn and the size is S1, S2, S3, S. 
so you have n files and 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 file i has the size or has a record number si now the problem is that we want to merge all this file and and into to make into one file now you observe in the last class of, we discussed about the merging of two files then there is a need of need of data movement from that you know uh, from one file to another file so if i have a file a and you have another file b and you want to merge you want to merge this to file suppose this is of size n this is size m and first what you do first you do what you do that this you need n plus m uh, record movements from for merging these two files okay so uh, for this case also that how I, if i merge f1 with f2 then i need s1 plus s2 or uh, the record movements and then if i take this one then you need again s1 plus s2 plus s3 data record movement and so on now well, that you know yeah, our target should be such or, or our problem should be like that that you merge these files into one file in such a way that number of record movement is minimum is minimum there one way could be that you first merge this two then you merge item with this one merge item with this one and then merge item with this one and so on right the another way could be that you merge these two this two and this two and this two then merge with this one with this one and so on there are several ways you can merge you can merge this n files right you know to understand the problem say like, let us assume that i have five files f1 f2 f3 f4 and f5 and size of the files could be 5 10 20 50 and maybe this one is 30 so if i merge first this one then this one and then merge this whole file and then this whole thing then let us see how many record movements will be there to merge these two files you need 25 record movements to merge this again 25 now to merge these two you need 50 and to merge this with this you need 80 so the total number of record movement becomes 25 25 50 and then 80. So it is becoming 180 record movements. Now let us think about the other way. You have 10, 15, 5, 20, 30. And suppose I merge this one first, then this one, then this one, and then finally this one. In that case, here 25 record movements, here 30 record movements, here 50 record movements, and here 80 more record movements. In that case, total becomes 25 plus 30 plus 50 plus 80. So you get 185 record movements. Is it 185? 100, 185. Okay. Now what happens? If I first merge this two, then the merge item is merged with this one, then whole thing is merged with this one, and finally merge this one. In that case, here it is 15, here 15 plus 15 is 30, here it is 20, and here it is 30. So number of record movement becomes 15, 30, 20, 30, 
and this becomes 30 plus 20, 50, and this becomes 80. 50, and this becomes 80. So this is what you call 95, 175. Now can you tell me what is the best way to do it? Yes. Uh, what you have to do is that you first try to get the pile with the smallest size and you try to mark that. Then you select again pile with the smallest one and you try to mark. Say for example, uh, suppose this is instead of 15, it is 25. Okay. In that case, instead of marking this one, instead of marking this one, you should have marked this one. Then it becoming, it is becoming file size becoming 35. Now that this file, this file, and this file among these three, the, you consider the two of smallest ones, these two are the smallest one, so which size becomes 55, and then you mark it. Okay? So basically, if I represent in the form of tree, so what I will do, I will be putting first five and I merge with the 10, I get 15, and then I get 20. You get 35, and then this side you get 25 and 30. You get 55, you get 90. Okay? So the number of record movements will be 3 times of 5. 3 times. Okay? Because 5 has to move up to this. So 3 times of 5 plus 3 times of 10 plus 20 into 2 times plus 25 into 2 plus 30 into 2. Okay? So the effect is 15 plus 30 plus 40 plus 50 plus 60. This gives you 150, 150, 195. So that is the way you can solve this. So what you have done here, you first thing is that you have picked, uh, you have picked up the two files with the smallest, smaller in size uh, at the bottom most level, and then you merge them, and you fix up the two smallest files again, merge them, and so on. Okay. So formula becomes. Di into Wi, where Wi is the Wi is the number of records in the file ith file, and Di is the distance of the ith record from the root. Now the next type of problem which we can solve through greedy method is finding the minimum spanning tree. Okay. Uh, suppose G be the graph, weighted graph. Say, The weighted graph you have, and you want to obtain the uh, a tree from this weighted graph, so the sum of the weights is minimum. Okay, and uh, uh, first thing is that if I forget about this, I am looking for the spanning tree, 
then from this tree, from this graph, you have to find out the tree with n minus 1 ages and n minus 1 ages that will give you the spanning tree. So, for this graph, one spanning tree could be this one, okay. So, this is 10, 5, and 8. Another spanning tree could be this one, which is weight is 10, 7, and 5. Another spanning tree could be Five, seven, and eight. Oh, sorry, not seven. It is twelve. Okay. And the cost of the spanning tree is the sum of these weights. So the spanning tree having the minimum cost is known as minimum spanning tree. Now the two well-known, if you remember correctly, there are two well-known algorithm exist. One is the Prince algorithm. Another one is so let us discuss the Kuskal algorithm and uh, let uh, give you the graph. What is set of what is a V and E is the number of ages and let us assume the number of vertices is there. And the blue eye or weight is assigned, the blue eye is the weight assigned to the age, age between VI and VJ. WIJ is the weight assigned between VI and VJ. Now since I, I have to obtain M3, so let T be the tree. Initially, it is null t. Okay, and we have to finally obtain, if possible, a tree of having the number of ages, number of ages as n minus one, as n minus one. Now, initially, this wave uh, weights, their ages are arranged in increasing order. Initially, ages are arranged in increasing order means uh, with respect to their weights, right? Ages are arranged in the order of, in the increasing order of weights, okay? Now, the algorithm test will be like that while the number of ages are in the tree is less than n minus 1 and less than n minus 1 and e is not empty okay this number of element number of ages in the tree is less than not yet n minus 1 and e is not empty Select H U V the minimum cost. The minimum cost. Okay. You select an H from E having the minimum cost. From E having Now you see, after selecting this UV, you have to say, can I put it in my tree T? You, uh, what it means, that if, if I put it in my tree T, it should not create a cycle. Okay, that is the thing you have to see. So, the check whether, whether T UV and UV creates a cycle. If yes, 
then you cannot consider uv for your spanning for your minimum spanning key you just discard just discard uv discard uv from it. else it is not creating you add is p union uv and delete uv from it from it okay so that is your algorithm so what it does initiality is 5 while number of edges is less than n minus 1 uh, and is not empty is not empty select an age uv from e that is must have the minimum cost and then you see if i add this one here in t it should not create a cycle if it creates cycle then you discard uv from e and otherwise you add it into the tree and then delete uv from e now after coming out from this y loop you check whether number of ages in t is n minus 1 or not if it is n minus 1 you got the minimum cost spanning tree so that is the kuskas algorithm now next paradigm is dynamic programming this is also one of the most well known paradigms of being used in different places one simple one is that finding the all pair shortest path problem and here the strategy is like that uh, suppose you have a graph with a graph g and you want to find the all pair of shortest paths what you do that given the cost matrix or weighted weight matrix uh, that you see that by inclusion of kth node whether kth node whether your cost or path becomes shorter or not if it is shorter you consider that is the strategy is very simple that suppose you have i at any instant of j you have the shortest path so you have the path shortest path by a by some nodes by some some nodes uh, or by some vertices lying between 1 to k minus 1 now by if you have the at the k stage what we do that we like to introduce the node k and uh, and you check the path Si or weight of weight of the path from i to k and k to j if you find the sum of this weight is less than the, the original weight whatever you obtain from i to j then instead of using this path this path you now use this path okay that is the idea so dynamically you are updating your shortest path Suppose you have, you have to write this algorithm, suppose Cij is the weight of, weight of, or cost of the age Ij. Now, I don't want to touch this one, so I write for i equals to 1 to n for j is equals to 1 to n say a i j is your c i j and we will update this a i j matrix for our what the algorithm is for a equals to 1 to n for i equals to 1 to n for j is equals to 1 to n e i j is replaced by minimum of AIJ and AIJ plus okay. What is the physical meaning of that? That I am 
consider whatever the shortest path I have using I have between I and J using the vertices 1, 2, 3 up to K minus 1 and, and I have the shortest path from I to K using the vertices 1 to K minus 1 plus the shortest path using the vertices K but between K and A using the vertices 1 to K minus 1 and that will be replaced by the replaced uh, the real will be replaced by the trend okay this is the one thing and similar type of problem is the traveling suspend problem which you can solve using the binary this is the dynamic programming the another problem is problem generally uh, we solve using the uh, using the dynamic program is optimal binary task tree okay Here what happens, the problem is that suppose you have the several identifiers, several identifiers, say uh, ID1, ID2, and ID3, say ID, there are N identifiers, and uh, you know this identifier, uh, we like to search uh, several times. For example, in the case of compiler, you have started to say if, then, else, these are the identifiers, and, and you have written, suppose, if one. Now, I want to check whether if one is an identifier or not. So, you will be searching it, right? Say, for example, I have if, another one is then, another one is say end, another one is while, right? Say I have these four identifiers. So I can arrange this or put them in the form of binary tree. Say for example, if I write if is the identifier first, and this side will be end, this side it may be while, and this side it may be then. Another one could be, another one could be a yeah, no. I want to put here then this side it is end, this side if it is if, and this side is your y. Another way I can put A is that it can be uh, say then, and this side it is if this side is n and this side is y. Okay? There are several other ways you can have your... Now suppose I want to check that whether if, ex if one exists or not. So what I'll do, I'll search here. Now I'll come here if... Now I'll be looking whether there exists anything or not. If it is not, then you tell that this is not there. Now, similarly is the case with suppose why it exists or not. Well, now you come here and yes, it exists and it becomes a successful search. So, so there is a question of coming that uh, number of comparisons you will be performing, you will be performing. Uh, to find out whether an identifier exists or not. Okay. Now, for this case, for this case, uh, if it is a successful search, uh, then average number of comparison is required. For then is one. For if it is two comparisons. For end is three comparisons, and while is two comparisons. So this is six plus five, six plus five is eleven. 11 number divided by 4, so that is your average number of comparisons, okay? But for this case, it is also 1, 2, plus 2, plus 3, and it becomes 5 plus 3, 8, 
8 divided by 4, so it becomes 2. Okay. So this is that you, if I assume that they are equally likely, then for a successful search, it becomes uh, 2.75 per number of average number of comparisons. In this case, it is 2, and in that case also, it will become the 2.75 and so on. So our target should be should draw a the tree in such a way that the average number of comparisons is minimum. Now the here we assume that all of them are equally likely and also we assume that that it is only the successful side. But what happens in reality, suppose I go for E font, then it becomes a failure one. Right? So uh, there is not only uh, that we are assuming that equally likely which is not correct because uh, it depends upon the programmer to programmer. Uh, so, one part is that the question is coming that for identifier ID1, the probability of successful search is PI and there will be, you observe that if I have the four N identifiers, then there will be N plus one failure search. That, that if I have one item say D2 and in that case it will come here because it does not exist. So it becomes a failure search. So there will be Q0, Q1, Q2, QI, Q0, Q1, and Qn. That many, that these are the probabilities for probabilities for unsuccessful search. Huh? That means this will lead to this class of identifier, this will lead to this, uh, this unsuccessful search leads to this class of items and so on, right? So, so such that summation over pi plus qi plus q0 plus q0 is 1, okay? pi is the probability for i identified successful such and q0, q1, q2, qn are the probability for unsuccessful searches then you have q0 plus summation over pi q plus qi is equal to 1. Now, what is your problem? Now, problem is that you have to put the identifier in such a way that, in such a way that the cost is minimum. Cost means? That if I put I is identified in the level T, then Ti, uh, then you will be writing the Ti into Ti and so on. So the cost should be minimum. So this can be solved in using the dynamic programming. Now the next type of paradigms is back taking and blind taking problem. I think that this also, I don't want to discuss uh, much on this aspect, but what I want to tell that uh, one problem is that uh, graph coloring problems. Okay? So what can you do? That you have any of the in vertices, you want to color one a vertex by one color, and then they go to the next vertex and to put the color, another type of color, and you check that if by putting that color, it fails to satisfy the criteria of graph coloring, then if it is, then go back and then go up and if you hear note, you just to put different type of color. So that is one example of back checking. Similarly, the case of N queen problems, that the problem is to put the queen on the shell board, N plus N shell board, in such a way that no queen attack the other queen. For example, I have a chess board of four cross four. And I have the four queens, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. Okay. So, uh, and two queens attack each other diagonally or if I place them in diagonally or for this uh, row wise or 
they have to be given that they will call out. Okay, I want to put these four queens in such a way that they are not on the same diagonal, not on the same row, and not on the same column. So if I put Q1 here, Q2 cannot be put here, Q2 cannot be put here, cannot be put here, cannot be put here. So I can put, I cannot put Q2 here, I can put Q2 here. Okay, once I put the Q2 here, where shall I put Q3? I cannot put here. Okay. I cannot put here, I cannot put here, I cannot, cannot, I cannot put here, I cannot put here, I cannot put here, I cannot put here, I cannot put here. Once I cannot put here Q2, Q3, and so what shall I do? So with the assumption, for to simplify that assumption, let us assume that QI is placed in the ith row, QI is placed in the ith row, okay? Uh, so Q3 should be placed here. Now once I know that Q3 position is, cannot be this one, cannot be this one, cannot be this one, cannot be this one, what shall I do? I backtrack. Now I try to put the position of Q2. So can it be here? Let us assume that Q2 is here. Now what happens? Q3 cannot be here. Q3, yes. Q3 can be here. So I put Q3 here. Right? Because it is not attacking by Q1, it is not attacking by Q2. Now what happens? Where shall I put? Where can I put my Q4? Can I put Q4 here? No. Q4, no. Q4, no. Q4 here? No. What shall I do now? Now you backtrack. Can I put Q3 here? No. Can I put Q3 here? No. Now can I put Q2? Q2 has gone. So. I have to put Q1 in different place. So I have to put Q1 here. Now if I put Q1 here, what, where shall I put Q2? I cannot put here, 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 I can put here. Now if it is the case, where can I put Q3? Q3 I can put it here. If I put Q3 here, Q4 I can put here. So you observe that you get a solution where the no queen is attacking each other. Now, there may be several, it is not the unique solution, you may have the different, uh, also different ways to put these values or cues in the chessboard to get the solution. Okay? So this is all about the backtracking. Similarly, you can solve, you can find out the branch and bound and other things. Now, one thing I want to uh, uh, discuss is the traversal algorithm. This we need to know for our future studies. Now, the first problem is that uh, suppose I have a binary tree and I want to traverse the binary tree. How we can traverse? Now we tell this is the root and you have the left subtree and you have the right subtree. Okay? Now in order to traverse this binary tree with n nodes, uh, there are several ways you can traverse. One way could be that I traverse first root, then left subtree, then right subtree. And recursively, I go for the for the left subtree root, left, right, and so on. Another one could be root, right subtree, left subtree. Another one could be left subtree, root, right subtree. Another one could be right subtree, root, left subtree. Another one could be left subtree, root, right subtree, root, or right subtree, left subtree, root. These are the six possible ways you can traverse your binary tree. Now, uh, see, this is basically the mirror of this, so generally we do not consider this thing. So basically, we have the three ways to traverse a binary tree. One is the root first, then right sub left subtree, then right subtree. Another one is the left subtree, root, right subtree. Another one is left subtree, root, right subtree. 
So, for example, if I have a, b, c, b, c, f, g, h, Suppose you have this binary tree. Now, this traverse is known as pre-order traversing. This is known as in order, and this is known as post-order Okay. So if I traverse pre-order using the pre-order traversing. Then pre-order tells the root first, then left subtree, then right subtree. Now left subtree is this one. So if I have traversed, then B is, then left subtree, D, then G, then E, then H, then L, then K, then C, and then F. Now, if I traverse in order, then first is left subtree, then root, the right subtree. Now you have come here, first is left subtree, then root, the right subtree. Now you have first left subtree, then root. So it becomes that G, D, B, Then H, L, E, K, E, C, F. And if I traverse post order, then left subtree, right subtree, and then root. Now left subtree. Right subtree, then root, then left subtree, right subtree, so G, D, right subtree, left subtree, right subtree is L, H, K, E, B, F, C, A. Okay, so I think this you remember. Uh, we discuss all these things in your undergraduate curriculum. Now, one thing you remember, one thing you remember that if I know one of the this either pre-order or post-order and in order, I can generate the binary uniquely. But this is not the case if I know pre-order and post-order, but not the in order. Okay. In order to see that, suppose I know that pre-order and in-order, let us see how how we can generate the binary tree. See, from the pre-order, I can get the who is the root of this node, which is A. Now, from the in-order, I can find out, I can find out that what are those elements in the left subtree and what are the elements in the right subtree. So this gives you that this much is on the left subtree, this much is on the right subtree. Now from pre-order again, I can find out who is the root, which is B. Again from here, I can find out this is the left subtree and this is the right subtree of B. So GD is here and this is here. Now from the dg, gd, I get d, so I know that d is the root and g is, d is the root and from here you get the g is the left of d, so it is g. Okay. 
Okay. Now once you know D, so I have done this one, I have done this one, this one, this one. Now I have this part. E is the root. So I write here E. Once I know the E, E is here. H and L is the left subtree of E. H and L, so H is the root. And L is the right subtree. And E, K. K is the right of E, so K. Then you have C and F. C is the root. And F is the right, so it is F. So similarly, if I have the pre-order, and uh, if I have the post-order in order, I can generate the binary tree uniquely. But in the case, I, if I have the pre-order and post-order, I am in problem. I know that from the pre-order, I can get the root of the tree, which is A, which is here. But after that, I don't know which are the elements in the left side and right side. So as a result, you cannot draw the conclusion of it. Now the next one is that traversing the graph. If I complete this one, then your the preliminary of algorithms part is over, so that we can go for the parallel algorithm material. So there are two ways we can traverse the graph. One is known as breadth first search. In short, we KL BFS. Another one is known as depth first search. In short, we tell here. So difference between these two is that suppose you have a graph. Suppose you have a graph and what I, it does that one is that you first Good. Select this, visit this node, and then you visit all is adjacent, all is adjacent. Then for each adjacent, then you go to the next one, and so on. So it is a level wise, basically, you are searching. The other method is that no, you first search is you come to this, then you come to this, come to this, then you finish this one, then you finish this one. That is known as depth first search. Hopefully. You remember those things. But if I have to write the algorithm for breadth-first search, say, you can write BFS, and B is the starting node, then visited B is 1, and I write U equals to V. Now, for all vertices and also initialize Q to empty. For all vertices, you adjacent from you to the following if visited W is zero, that is not yet visited, then So this comes under follow. 
And if if Q is not empty, not empty, delete and repeat and repeat this. Okay. So what it does basically for all vertices W adjacent from U uh, do the following if visited W, W is not yet visited then you visit that one and you add W to that. And you, you repeat this thing for all adjusted vertices, that is the same level things. And if you find that Q is not empty, you take the one, delete one element from Q from the top and repeat this process because you have to find out W and so on. But in the case of death pass, in the case of death pass, the idea is let, uh, you have to go into the depth of the graph and the algorithm becomes uh, different, little different, DFS uh, uh, U and visited algorithm becomes like that, visited VU is equals to 1 and for all what he says W adjacent to U adjacent to V, this is I consider here V, do the following. If visited V, visited W is equal to 0, then VFS okay. Here it is that you check what we are doing that you check with the visited VFS V. The visited V is 1. I am setting it first. Now for all vertices of W adjacent to V, you see whether W is visited or not. If not, then you call DFS W. Otherwise, you go to the next adjacent vertex or adjacent vertex of V and you check again and so on. So that is the DFS or death first search and this algorithm is where the you need to implement that shift. So with this we like to stop our web here today and we assume that we have discussed the different paradigms on sequential algorithms. So next class we will be discussing about that need of parallel algorithms, different types of parallel models and and we'll start designing some algorithms. Thank you.